Thank you for coming this evening. Please turn to the book of Malachi. We are nearing the end of the book of Malachi. We're in chapter 3, beginning in verse 13 this evening. Uh, Malachi is not only the last book of the Old Testament, but the last of the minor prophets. And he, along with Haggai and Zechariah, were prophets to the people who were returning from captivity in Babylon. But Malachi's message is that the people had returned to sins in a number of ways. He accuses them by inspiration of various sins that they've done wrong. They haven't appreciated God's love. They've offered polluted sacrifices. Uh, they're, they're doing some errors with regard to marriage and divorce, accusing God of, God of injustice. And last time we talked in specifically about the tithes and the offerings. And they said, God said they were robbing him in tithes and offerings. So tell me something you can recall from last week in our study uh, about the tithes and the offerings. What was the accusation? What were they doing wrong? What should we learn? Comments you have from our study last week. Anybody? What did we learn last week about tithes and offerings? Terry. <clears throat> One of the things that um, they're consistent in is when God tells them they've done something wrong towards him, their response is, how have we done what you're accusing us of? They don't take any personal responsibility for um, what God is accusing them of. In this case, that they have not brought the tithes that they're supposed to into the temple. Okay, so as every time, really, I think every time that God has made accusations against them, they question why, what have we done? Uh, not willing to accept responsibility. And in this case, he's accusing them of robbing him with regard to tithes and offerings. And they questioned it. They denied that, he, that they were guilty of it. Uh, anything else you learned from the discussion of the tithes and the offerings? Anybody? Karen? There are many different ways we can rob God in that way we discuss not only um, our monetary offering and contribution, but our time, our lives, um, our work. Okay, so the lesson was that they owed it to God to pay what he had commanded them to give, and by not doing it, they were robbing him. And since that's what uh, they were guilty of, we can be guilty too, not of necessarily the same because we're not under the same law, but nevertheless, we are responsible to obey God. There are things we owe him. Anytime we owe something to God and we don't give it, we've robbed him. And so we uh, learned that at a great length than last time. Questions or discussion through verse 12 in chapter 3 of Malachi before we move on. Frank. Well, um, the purpose for the tithes we discussed was for, uh, it was an inheritance for the uh, for the Levites who served in the temple, served as priests, and also for the widows and orphans and the poor and the, the needy to, to help provide for them. And we have that <coughs> same responsibility today to care for, for those people that are in need. Okay, we do have a financial responsibility, don't we? It's not for Levites as such because that was an Old Testament uh, institution. But we do have financial responsibilities. We have responsibility towards the church. We have responsibility to help uh, those who are in need and so on. So uh, we could be guilty financially, even as they were, uh, but we could also be guilty in a number of other ways. All right, so then this evening, as we proceed, we're going to look at uh, another accusation that God makes against them, beginning in verse 13. Uh, let's go ahead and read... Let's just read 13 through 15 right now. Who would like to read chapter 3, verse 13 through 15, please? Chapter 3, Bill, verse 13 through 15, please. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud and blessed, for those who do wickedness are raised up. 
then even tempt God and go free. All right. So here we have the next accusation. And it really seems to me like the discussion of this accusation goes through the end of the book. Uh, right past the chapter break. So again, God has an accusation against them in verse 13. We're question now number 24. What's his accusation? What does what he accuse him of in verse 13? Bill? He said they've been harsh against me. Spoken harsh things against him. That's what the Lord said. And what did they respond? They admit their guilt this time. How do they respond? Bill, I uh, steamy red. They say, what, what have we spoken against you? They questioned him. Same answer as always. What do you mean? What have we said? You say we've been harsh. What have we said? So God gives the answer. But they're obviously in denial, uh, as they have been throughout the book. So God's answer, verse 14, and we're now on question number 25. Uh, what was it they said that God said was harsh against him? What, is it, what did they say? Verse 14 and 15. Sure. You're saying that there's no uh, profit to keeping God's ordinances, but as usual, the problem is they're not keeping his ordinances. They're not obeying him, so of course they're not seeing any blessings. All right, so they think what profit is there to keep his ordinances? In other words, what, what benefit is there in doing what he's, God says? So I ask you question number 26 to explain this and uh, how might people be guilty of this today to say that what profit is there in keeping his ordinances uh, it's useless to serve God what benefits that how do sometimes people talk or think that way today Susan well they're looking more for a, a physical benefit than a spiritual uh, benefit <coughs> okay alright so in what way would, were they, you would think, looking for a physical benefit? And sometimes people today look for physical benefits in serving God and then get disappointed when it doesn't happen. How might that be true in a physical sense today? Or in them, what, what was it in, them, in their case? Karen? Well, um, a lot of times if something goes wrong in people's lives, um, and they've been trying to serve God, they say, well, you know, I, it discourages them, and they blame God, and they say, you know, what, what's the point if, if I'm going to have these bad things happen? Um, sometimes people suffer really bad things, like someone really close to them dies unexpectedly, and, um, you know, it's a struggle, but, and unfortunately, sometimes they blame God for that, and they, they just makes it worse for them. Okay, so sometimes it's just physical problems in this life. And there are physical problems. Uh, it doesn't matter. Some have more than others, but all of us have physical problems at times, uh, whether it's health problems or financial problems, or as Karen said, maybe the death of a loved one. And so it's easy to say, what's the point of serving God if, if I want to have problems just as surely as other people have problems, and maybe even worse, what's the point? Okay? Other comments on why they might have said this and why people today might say this kind of thing? Susie? Uh, sometimes people, uh, we can be guilty also of not accepting God's answer to um, our prayers. That you know, we, we want something specific, perhaps, and God knows that that's not perhaps good for us and doesn't give us that or he's asking us to be patient and to wait for him and to trust him, which is what ultimately he's going to tell these people too. Okay, so sometimes it's a matter of unanswered prayers that we pray. If something makes sense to us, this would be a good thing. Uh, why would God not give me that? And so we pray and it doesn't happen. And so we think, well, what's the point in serving God if he's not going to answer our prayers and I've had people flat out tell me that 
Uh, I prayed for such and such. It didn't happen. Why should I serve God? Okay. Other comments or discussion on what would people lead people to say it's useless to serve God and we've kept his ordinances and, and what's, what's the good of it? Uh, Frank. Uh, some people say that, well, they, they don't want to be responsible for their actions, so they, they are blaspheme and argue against uh, any religion, some people do, and will, uh, or any kind of faith, and argue that God's book of his, his word is just a, a bunch of laws that uh, that hinder us and don't want us to have any fun as the world sees it, and uh, that they just want to blame God for uh, making accusations against God for the uh, lifestyle that they want to have. Okay, I think there's a couple of things in, in that comment, uh, Frank. One is some people just question why, why does God allow, allow suffering? Why would a good God allow there to be a hardship like this? Uh, and so they just won't want to believe in God. But others don't want to make sacrifices to serve God. They don't, uh, they don't realize the importance of giving up things that they enjoy doing because they're sinful or being involved in the church and attendance and giving and, and studying their Bibles and teaching others. That those things don't make sense to them. So they don't want to make the sacrifice. What's the point then of service to God? Okay. So there's a lot of ways this can happen to even today. So verse 15, what did they, uh, what did they say as a result of this attitude in verse 15? What came from it? Verse 15. Terry. <clears throat> they, they accuse God of blessing the arrogant and that evildoers prosper. Uh, they put God to the test, but they escape. God is not just in the way he treats the, the righteous and the wicked. Okay, so they look at people who are not serving God, uh, people who do, are proud or who do wickedness, and look at how things are going for them. Well, look how they're raised up and uh, they even they test God. They don't serve God, but yet they go free. They don't suffer for it. So why should we serve God? There's all these good people. I mean, bad people, rather. Look how well they've got it. Um, did that remind you of some scriptures? Terry? In Psalm 73, it's basically what that psalm is about. A righteous man who um, says, uh, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slept, slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And it goes on to talk about how he felt about those things. And then finally comes to verse um, 15 or 16 where it says, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in a slippery place and you make them fall to ruin. Their, their end is going to be awful. And okay. Righteous man finally brings to mind the fact that where they're headed is not someplace he wants to go. All right, so that's the passage that I had in mind. I didn't have it listed or referred to in the questions, but that's a passage that I had in mind. The Bible discusses this concept in other places as well. And the lesson that the author of Psalm 73 learned is the lesson these people need to learn, the lesson we need to learn, and that is don't look at the short term, look at the long term. Yes, there's gonna be problems in this life. Yes, there's sacrifices. All these different things we talked about, that's true. But that's not the end of it. Our reward for serving God is not based primarily in this life, on this earth, and certainly not physical. It's after this life, at the judgment, in eternity. That's when God is going to give us 
the ultimate reward for our service. And the Bible repeatedly makes the point, Romans chapter 8 and 2 Corinthians 4 and other passages, that when you look at the ultimate end result, that what we suffer here, our problems here, are relatively light compared to the reward that God will give us if we're faithful. Okay, and that's what these people needed to learn. And uh, let's see some specific applications he makes as he goes along. But uh, that's, I think, uh, the point that we need especially to keep in mind. Okay, now we'll look at the, the next few verses. The questions are coming through 50. Now let's go on and look some more at the, what he says, and then we'll make some more applications as we read for the 16 through 18. And I'd like to read chapter 3, 16 through 18 for us. Chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. we would like to read that for us, please. Steve, please. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, and the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Okay. So here begins the answer. We've already touched on it. But this is God's answer as he looks at those who do fear him. Now we talked in verses 13 to 15, those who say, why serve him? There's problems, difficulties, and other people not serving him. Things go well for them. Why should we serve him? Here's the answer God begins to by talking about those who do serve him. And what does he say? What's his answer as he talks about those who serve him? Question number 27 now. Uh, yeah, question 27. What's his answer about those who do serve him? See, those who fear the Lord and everything is recorded in God's book of remembrance. God has a book of remembrance. All those sacrifices, all those hardships, whatever we serve, do to serve the Lord, God knows, remembers every one of them. It's in his book. Okay? So question number 28, what's about the passage about this book and what's the significance of it? It's the scriptures about this book of remembrance. It's not always called that. Karen. Uh, Philippians 4.3 says, I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement, also with the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. All right. The names are in the book of life, God's book of remembrance. Okay, other passages? Susan. Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the, the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. All right. So, the book of life, the book of God's remembrance, has to do with the ultimate reward when life is over. Bill, you have another one? Uh, Psalm 66, verse 16. Come in here, all of you who fear God, and I will declare that he has done for my soul. All right. So God remembers. He knows what we've done. Here he talks about then those who, those who fear the Lord. They speak up, and the Lord listens to them. And a book of remembrance is written for him, verse 16 now. Those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. So ultimately the passage, especially in Revelation 20 there, that's going to be brought out at the judgment. There may be times in this life when we don't understand. When it's confusing, we just don't seem like things are making sense to us. But that's not the end. God is still in charge. He knows what he's doing. It's his world. He'll make it right. But wait, wait on the Lord, his time, his way, and ultimately in the judgment when the book of remembrance is brought up. All right, other comments on verse 16 in the book of remembrance, anybody else? Steve. In Psalm 56, verse eight, you number my wanderings, 
Put my cares into your bottle. Are they not in your book? All right. So that in God's book, everything you've done to serve God, it's in his book. And the things that are in that book are going to determine where you and I spend eternity. Okay? Now the next verse. 17. Those in the book of remembrance, what does God say about them in verse 17? What does he say about them in verse 17? Question number 29 now. Susie. Well, uh, he refers that on that, uh, refers to um, on the day, and uh, this is like the day of the Lord, uh, a day of judgment, uh, and a day of, um, uh, what's the other word? Um, reward, reward also uh, for the evil and the good. And uh, he says that he would make these those that feared him his jewels or his own special treasure and would spare them from destruction. Okay. Other comments on 17? Okay. Um, you know, that phrase, they shall be mine, means a lot. Um, we belong to the um, omnipotent Jehovah God. And um, Trevor's lessons on Sunday morning, my people, it means a lot to belong to God. Sure. The end of verse 17 is very ironic. Um, that God says he will uh, spare his people as a man spares his own son who serves him. But in order for God to spare us, he had to not spare his only begotten son. Okay. Other comments? I don't know about you, folks. Oh, Frank, go ahead. Oh, I was just thinking that Sometimes people uh, think that they've, they're having a rough time in this life and suffering a lot. But if we, uh, we read about some of the prophets and, and Christians that suffered the persecutions of those early days of the church, uh, that they were, were persecuted so severely, uh, with the way they were punished and put to death and the, the hunger and, and lack of clothing and, and uh, so many things that they suffered and, and uh, in those some of those passages in Revelation it tells us that they will receive their reward for, for being steadfast in serving God Okay, and even in verse 17, and back, back to somewhat to, to Karen's point, I, I don't know how much that strikes you, but that, that really strikes me. God said, these are mine. These are mine. Are you one of God's people? Would God say that about you? And then he says, they're like my jewels. So it's not this simple-minded thing. Look around, there's problems, so forget it. There's no point in serving it. It's the end result. What's going to come in the end, in the day of judgment? When God's people are his jewels, and he'll spare us. Anything else? Verse 17. What? One man that did a lot of suffering was Job. Okay. Other than Job, you know, Christ did the ultimate suffering for us. And that's the lesson of the book of Job, too, isn't it? Same thing we're talking about. Job's point was, why, why should I serve God if I'm going to suffer like this? Why has God let me suffer this way? And that's the end of the book of Job, God's answer. I know what I'm doing. I'm in charge here. You didn't make the world. I did. I made the the world and I'm in charge 
In the end, it'll come out right. Don't question the justice of God. Don't criticize God because he is so much wiser than we are. He's always right. He's always just. He's always fair. You can trust him, but you've got to serve him. Okay? And so what's the conclusion then in verse 18? Where does this lead us to in verse 18? Terry? Well, the question has often been all of the minor prophets, really, but in Malachi, uh, this idea that um, the wicked get away with their wickedness, and it's not going to be that way. There will be one final time, then once more you'll see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Uh, between one who serves God and one who does not serve Him. It will be very clear. It's not always that obvious in this life, is it? You can't look at the events here and say, see, that's, this, this, this proves that these people are good because they're not suffering and this proves these people are bad because they are suffering. You can't look at it in this life. But God will make the distinction. He'll make the difference. He'll discern between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not serve Him. He'll make it right. Serve him. It'll be worth it. Terry. I think this helps us, this particular scripture helps you to deal with people who think that in the end God's going to take everybody and save them all. Everyone's going to go to heaven. And that's not what God has said. And he makes it very clear that's not the way that it's going to be. And it's uh, foolish to place your hope that God's going to just let everybody into heaven. It's not. Okay. Susie. Um, do you understand mm -hmm. 